Excellent. What's up guys, welcome back to Paul's Hardware. This is Probing Paul, episode number 16. This is my monthly Q&A series that I do every month. That's what makes it monthly. And if you're interested in going back into the history, there's a playlist for you uh, where you can go back and look at the previous episodes. All the questions from today are taken from the comment section from last week's video. So let's dive right into it. First question here from Steven Bach. Uh, hey Paul, what would be the best CPU and graphics card setup for a family room 65 inch 4K TV build. Uh, I feel like there's been more interest in like the family room setup, the gaming setup for uh, 4K TVs since those are becoming a lot more affordable. So it might surprise you given a lot of the negative response to the recent launch of Intel's X299 platform, but your answer is going to be this CPU right here, which is the 7740X. Uh, as well as an X299 motherboard, um, you know, some, something like one of these, and uh, overclock the 7740X as much as you can. You'll probably be able to get 5 to 5.1 gigahertz out of it if you're going with a decent air cooling setup, maybe even a little bit more if you go with an all-in-one. However, I like to stay away from those for the living room setups just because they can make a little bit more noise depending on the pump and everything like that. Pair this with a GeForce GTX 1080 Ti of any variety from any of uh, NVIDIA's add board partners, and that will give you the best CPU and graphics combination, because right now, clock speed is still king when it comes to graphics performance, and the 7700K or the 7740X is basically the best chip for pure gaming out there right now. Now, all that said, you're going to pay an extra 100 bucks or so premium for the motherboard with an X299 configuration, so strongly can consider just going with the 7700K. You won't be able to overclock it quite as much, but you'll invest a lot less in the platform. Of course, you got options beyond that, too. You can look at Ryzen and that kind of thing, um, but you are going to see a little bit of trailing off in the actual gaming performance, especially if you're pairing it with a high-end gra graphics card like a 1080 Ti. But for 4K, you should, by and large, be just fine. So I'd say uh, consider those options, but you asked for what's best, and best right now is still going to be the options on the Intel side. Thank you for that question, though, Stephen. Let's move on to question two from Cody Espinoza. Hey Paul, I'm looking to upgrade my 1080p 60Hz monitor. Had my eye on Asus PG279Q because I hear that high refresh rate is one of those things you just don't come back from. I would agree with that, Cody. My question is, should I go for this or wait, uh, or go for 4K or ultra wide for that matter? I have a GTX 970, but I'm looking to upgrade in the next few months. Uh, Cody, I hope when you do upgrade, the prices have dropped at least a little bit for the GPUs, because right now they're all really overpriced. More on that in a, uh, with another question though, that I'll be answering. Here's that ASUS monitor though, the ROG Swift PG279Q. It is an absolutely gorgeous monitor, uh, G-Sync, high refresh rate, IPS panel, so it's got really good color uh, reproduction, 2560 by 1440. I think this is a great option for you if you're looking to spend around seven to $800 on a monitor. Uh, there's a few reasons for that. One, it's got that kind of trifecta of stuff that you want for gaming, high refresh rates, uh, IPS is great for color depth, and then of course G-Sync, some variable refresh rate technology, whether it's G-Sync with an NVIDIA graphics card, whether it's FreeSync with an AMD graphics card, you're gonna want that for gaming if you're moving up to the next level beyond 108060. Another reason this is a good choice for you is you won't need quite as much graphics horsepower to push 2560 by 1440 versus 4K. In fact, quite a bit less. Uh, for 4K, you really need to be investing in the highest end graphics cards right now. I'd say upgrading to a GTX 1070 for you would be a perfect choice going from your 970 with a monitor like this. Uh, and then of course, the other thing to consider is gonna be ultra wide. If you want G-Sync with a 3440 by 1440 ultra wide though, there's quite a big price hike from there. You're probably gonna have to pay over a thousand bucks for that. So all these things considered, Cody, I think this monitor is actually a great choice for you. And I hope if you, if and when you actually get it, uh, you enjoy it a lot, because I certainly think you will. Next up is Milan Mr. Djenovic. Milan Merdijanovic, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Hey Paul, I'm a digital artist working mainly in programs like Photoshop. I also do some 3D modeling and I'm thinking about getting a new PC in the near future. Would you suggest Ryzen 1700X or an Intel 7700K for such a build? So whereas with the first question, I wholeheartedly endorsed Intel's uh, Skylake or KB Lake architecture. For your choice, you definitely want to go with that Ryzen 1700X. 
anytime you're dealing with heavily multi-threaded applications, uh, especially ones that can take advantage of threads beyond two or four cores, which uh, games have a harder time dealing with, but uh, enterprise or uh, digital artistry software tends to do a much better job at, especially rendering 3D models, you will definitely appreciate the additional cores and threads you get with the 1700X compared to the 7700K. Klaus Matthews asks, my parents will be in need of an upgrade from our old VHS player to something that plays DVDs in a very tight form factor. Should I get them a console or should I attempt to make them a cheap HTPC in the same range? This is an interesting question, not uh, least because of the fact that your parents are already using a VHS player, uh, but if you want to get them into the next generation, I would consider, if you're going to go potentially 4K in the future, something like the Xbox One S that has a 4K uh, Blu-ray player, uh, and that would allow you to get all the way up from VHS resolution to 4K, which would be a crazy jump. If you don't have a 4K television and you're just doing 1080, you're probably going to be fine with DVDs and Blu-rays, in which case, I don't think an HTPC would be quite as practical in the circumstances. They're a little bit more complicated. I'd go either with a dedicated uh, Blu-ray player, which you can purchase, and they're typically very small, and uh, they're also a lot easier for uh, parents who just are used to using a remote control can work with. Or if you do want to go with a computer route, uh, maybe consider even something like an old laptop uh, with, that has an HDMI out that has an optical drive in it. Uh, it might be a, a simple and quiet and low profile solution for you to get your parents up and running, but uh, I hope you can soon. I, I sure hope that they appreciate the increased resolution uh, jumping up from VHS. James Wood asked a question that actually got a couple really good responses, uh, and actually quite a few of my uh, questions that people ask on this video get really good responses so I wanted to give a shout out to any of you guys who are trolling the or not trolling but just perusing the comments and actually giving good answers but anyway James questions James Woods question was hey Paul I built a PC this past year with a Samsung 850 Evo 250 gig I've been using it a lot more than I originally thought so I'm worried about NAND endurance uh, and that maybe the SSD won't hold up as long as planned is there a way to monitor the remaining uh, endurance on the SSD and just to show you guys this is the Samsung 850 Evo right here. 250 gig version only costs about 100 bucks right now. Really good drive, uh, very solid. It uses 3D NAND. And the answers to the question, uh, first from John Totten. Thanks, John, for chiming in. Download the Samsung Magician software. Uh, definitely you want to get that to go along with the 850 Evo. You can set it up to use rapid mode, which uh, does some caching on your memory, which makes the drive even faster, and it will give you performance and reliability statistics. Uh, it also show you how much you've written to the drive overall, and you'll probably find that you're way, way, way under what it actually is. John Doe points out here it's got a five-year, 75 terabytes written warranty. So if you take 75 terabytes, uh, 1,000 gigs per terabyte, that's 75,000 terabytes. If you divide that by the number of days in five years, it ends up being about 40 or 41 gigabytes written per day, which is possible. I mean, if you're copying a lot of video footage or something like that, I regularly shoot a video and then have, you know, 40 to 60 gigs that I might drop onto something. But I don't do that every day. There's a pretty slim chance that you do too. So download that software, get some actual stats on the drive, and uh, also bear in mind that even if the NAND does wear out, if it gets past the point where it can't be program erased anymore, it will go to what is known as steady state. It can still be read, so you can still copy the data off of it, you just can't write to it anymore. In my experience though, when it comes to SSDs dying, it's not the NAND that wears out, it's the controller but I believe uh, with your controller and the A50 Evo, that's not much of an issue. Next question from Mui Copyright. Here's a question for you, G4560. With a Z270 motherboard now, and next year get an unlocked i7, or now just get the G4560 with a regular motherboard, and by regular, I assume you mean non-overclockable, so one of the budget chipsets like a B150 uh, or, or B, B250. Um, he also says he doesn't care about AMD, so I'm going to skip over any Ryzen recommendations that I might have given. Here's a G4560. It's popular because it's KB Lake architecture. It's low priced, although right now it seems kind of overpriced. You should be able to find this for 70 bucks. Uh, this this is expensive on Amazon right now, so maybe maybe search around and find a better price for it. But it's dual core uh, with hyper threading, and it's a great entry level chip. Um, but again, you're not going to be able to overclock. Uh, on a mother on an, on an inexpensive motherboard you can't overclock that Pentium chip anyway um, but I would say take a look at Z170 motherboards that are out there on the market and definitely I would say probably go for the upgrade path 
Now, if you get a Z170 motherboard, it might not out of the box be compatible with that processor. So maybe consider something like an Asus board that has USB BIOS flashback or Gigabyte with their, I forget what they call it, but it's basically the same thing as USB BIOS flashback. That will allow you to update your BIOS without needing uh, a processor or memory installed. Other than that, you might be able to find a Z170 board that says it's updated for KB Lake and it should be compatible out of the box. Um, but you can find those really cheap. I mean, there's Z170 boards. I mean, a lot of these are open box on Newegg, but down in the 70, 80, $90 price range, I might consider going more towards the say 100-ish to $120 price. Look for low end Z270 boards or look for a good deal on a last gen Z170 board. And with the Z170 board, even if you get like a 7700K or 7600K in the future, as long as the BIOS is updated so the KB Lake support is there, you will be able to overclock with Z170 or Z270. So uh, I think that would be a good option for you and uh, it would allow you to get a lot more life out of that system. Uh, also, if you install Windows on the system with the motherboard, you're gonna go through a much more painful upgrade process, swapping the motherboard out and you have to redo Windows and all that, and you might lose your license too. So that's also something to consider. A couple more questions left. This one's from Tortuga Paul. I got swept away in the rising Radeon RX prices due to mining. Uh, cryptocurrency mining, Ethereum mostly is what's going on right now that's causing all of the AA Radeon uh, GPUs to be sold out and or extremely overpriced. He says, I sold my RX 470 for a cool 350 bucks on eBay, went to go buy a GTX 1070 and found the 1070s are in the high $400 range or even $500 plus. Is it worth paying 500 bucks for an aging 1070 or wait for Vega? Now, waiting right now is, is just going to be a challenge because there's no telling how long this current bubble with the prices of uh, certain cryptocurrencies like Ethereum is going to last and how long it's going to be a viable choice to use uh, gaming GPUs to mine it. Now you're in a situation where if you had sold your 470 and immediately bought the 1070, you probably would have been okay. But now that all the Radeon cards are sold out, people are starting to use Nvidia cards to mine as well. They're not quite as efficient at it, but they still can get the job done. Now we talked about this a little bit on the live show yesterday and actually got some feedback from people that the higher end GPUs and Nvidia stack that use GDDR5X instead of GDDR5 don't perform quite as well. That means that the GTX 1080 prices have yet to go up. So if you're looking at a GTX 1070 close to $500, just get a GTX 1080. Uh, you're gonna get better performance and uh, you're not gonna pay the ridiculously inflated price that the 1070s are going for right now. Um, that said, if you can't afford the 1080, then it, it's probably just gonna be a wait and see game right now. Um, you did get a nice return on your 470, but the flip side to that is all the prices are still high and there's really no telling at this point when they're gonna come back down. So I wish I had a better answer for you than that, but if you're really considering going up towards 500 bucks, uh, maybe just grab a 1080. I think that'd be a good choice for you. Final question here from Gigzolt Botin. Simple question from Simple Man. Spaghetti or macaroni? Uh, I, I originally pulled this up because I thought it was going to be an easy answer, and then I thought about it, and I was like, well, you know, when it comes to straight pasta, if I'm going to have, you know, some marinara and some meat sauce or meatballs or something like that, I'm a purist. I like the spaghetti. I think it's a it's just, it's what I grew up with, you know, mom's spaghetti, right? Uh, however, I will say that when cheese is brought into the equation, macaroni and cheese, like, oh my God, I, I don't allow myself to eat it because it's so good and I eat too much of it. But um, I guess, I, I'm, I'm, I know I'm giving two answers, but those are my answers. <laughs> Usually spaghetti, macaroni when cheese comes into play. Anyway, guys, that's all for this episode of Probing Paul. I really hope that you have enjoyed it. Of course, leave me some uh, questions for next month if you want down in the comment section down below. And again, thanks to all the people who have been down there answering people's questions since it does take me about a month to get back to them every time I do this. Uh, I do have one last plug since I keep forgetting to uh, publish this, but this is my P.O. Box. Paul's Hardware P.O. Box 4325. If you guys want to send me something, we typically do uh, mail time every few weeks on the live show, so uh, send me some stuff. And I'm gonna try to publish this a few more places because I keep it kind of hidden right now, but I'm gonna start putting it in my description so people actually know where, where it is. Anyway guys, thanks again for watching this video. We'll see you next time.